Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. It was so gorgeous outside. And Lord, we pray tonight as we gather together to worship you and to hear from you that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, just uh, help us to understand the book of Revelation. There's so much in there and it can become so confusing and there's so much misinformation out there. Lord, speak to our hearts and show us the truth. And as always, Lord, as we worship you, may it truly come from our hearts out of love. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And if you remember from our study in Revelation chapter 6, this chapter flows from what is said in Revelation 6.17, as the inhabitants of the earth call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. I'm always amazed, and maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm amazed that they know where this judgment is coming from, but they still refuse to repent and turn to the Lord. And all they could do is try and hide from the Lord, but can you hide from God? Absolutely not. There's no place you go. So they're crying for the you know, mountains and rocks to fall on them, but that's going to do no good. And they say in verse they say at the end of this chapter, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who's able to stand? Well, remember as we began our study last time in Revelation chapter 7, we have seen that this chapter describes two groups of people who are able to stand before a holy and righteous God. And those people are the ones who have been washed of their sins by the blood of Jesus. You see, when you ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, you are instantaneously cleansed of all your sins. Paul put it like this, he said, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we may become the righteousness of God in him. And I do understand that there are many different views of who these people are here in Revelation chapter 7, but God goes through great effort to tell us so we are not confused. And I think many times when people come up with things that are different than what the scriptures are saying, They're trying to fit their theology into this picture instead of letting the scriptures speak for themselves. And as I've said, and we looked at this in great deal last time, the first group we looked at were the 144,000 Jewish witnesses or evangelists for Christ uh, that got saved, I believe, through the witness of uh, the two witnesses. I believe the two witnesses come on the scene, and we'll deal more with that as we uh, get in to the book of Revelation. They come on the scene early on during the tribulation period. They minister for three and a half years, and I think this is some of their fruit. Now, again, we don't have to guess who these people are. John tells us that these represent 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel who are saved during the tribulation period. And they're going to be sealed by God to protect them from the winds of judgment that will be blowing across the land. Now, once they're sealed, then these winds of judgment are unleashed. And we'll see the winds of judgment unleashed as we get into Revelation chapter 8, the trumpet trumpet judgments, and move on. Uh, We'll only cover the first four, actually, in Revelation chapter 8. The others come after that in chapter 9 and so on. Now... We're going to be looking, not at this, obviously we looked at this first group last time, we're going to look at the second group of people who are saved during the tribulation period. There's a difference, though. These are not sealed for protection like the 144,000, and we have to understand that. See, what's exciting to me, that even during the tribulation period, God is reaching out to sinful man. He could have just wiped them all out, but he's showing grace so they can turn to him and enter into eternity with him. Warren Worsby wrote this. He said, You cannot read the book of Revelation without developing a global outlook, for the emphasis is on what God does for people in the whole world. The Lamb died to redeem people out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. The great multitudes pictured here came from all nations, all kindreds, and all people and tongues. Go ye into... All the world and preach the gospel to every creature was our Lord's mandate. Absolutely. Now, when we think of persecution today, yeah, it's bad. There's many Christians who are being martyred for their faith. In fact, it's been said that there are more Christians persecuted in our day than at any other time in church history. 
That's pretty severe. But we haven't seen the depths of persecution until we see what's going on here in the tribulation period. Multitudes of believers, those who have come to faith during the tribulation period, are going to be martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. And what that tells me is that their faith was real. They were willing to die for what they believed. I'll share this story with you and kind of see what I mean about people willing to sacrifice for what they believe in. One writer said, from boyhood, one of my favorite stories has been the 40 martyrs of Sebasti. These 40 soldiers, all Christians, were members of the famed 12th Legion of Rome's Imperial Army. One day their captain told the emperor Licinius had sent out an edict that all soldiers were to offer sacrifice to the pagan gods. The Christians replied, you can have our armor and even our bodies, but our hearts' allegiance belongs to Christ. It was midwinter of A.D. 320, and the captain had them march onto a nearby frozen lake. He stripped them of their clothes, and they said they would either die or renounce Christ. Throughout the night, these men huddled together singing their song, Forty Martyrs for Christ. One by one, the temperature took its toll, and they fell to the ice. At last, there was only one man left. He lost courage and stumbled to the shore where he renounced Christ. The officer of the guards had been watching all this. Unknown to the others, he had secretly come to believe in Christ. And when he saw this last man break rank, he walked out onto the ice, threw off his clothes, and confessed that he also was a Christian. When the sun rose the next morning, there were 40 bodies of soldiers who had fought to the death for Christ. You know, when you have that kind of faith, it's impossible to extinguish those fires in a person. You know, I think of Paul the Apostles and many of the other disciples and, and so on. In the New Testament, man, it's hard to stop them when they're on fire for God. And that's what our faith needs to be like. Are we willing to die for Christ? I mean, many today don't even want to live for him. Are we willing to die for him? And Paul said, as he was going to Jerusalem, he heard over and over again, Chains and tribulations await me. He knew he was in trouble, Paul, when he was going to Jerusalem, right? What did he do? Exit stage left? No. He was going to go to Jerusalem, no matter the cost. He told the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify of the gospel of God. You see, Paul was going to serve the Lord no matter what he was going to encounter. And that's what we see here with these tribulation saints. They're going to be martyred for their faith, millions of them. And yes, some will die through the judgments that are being poured out. But these are going to stand strong. They're not going to take the mark of the beast. They receive the mark of God upon their lives as children of God through Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at this great multitude that are saved during this period of time. So with that as our introduction, let's pick up. Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 9. Let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. John wrote, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So John opens up, he says, after these things. After what things? After John saw these four angels holding back the winds of judgment from blowing across this world until these 144,000 Jewish witnesses for Christ were sealed. And after that, he sees this innumerable multitude in heaven standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. And John's kind of shocked by this. Startled because of what he saw. And here's where many miss the point and they attribute these people as the church. They say, well, this is the church. But the church is not part of the tribulation period. None of it. After the church age comes to an end back in Revelation chapter 3, as that last letter that Jesus wrote to the church in Laodicea was finished, the church age came to an end. John was caught up into heaven in Revelation chapter 4. Picture of the church taken to heaven before the tribulation starts in Revelation chapter 6 when that first seal is opened by Jesus and the Antichrist is unleashed upon this world. Now, 
We'll deal more with this point later on in this study, as John's going to seal the deal, you might say, who the, regarding who these people are and who they're not. So here's the thing. If the church is not here, if this is not the church, who is the multitude? I told you already. They're the group of people that come out of the tribulation period. Now, some try to make it the 144,000, but they're not the 100. How could they be the 144,000? Several reasons. The most obvious is that this group is innumerable, and the 144,000 are 144,000. I mean, it's not difficult, is it? It's pretty simple. If one group is innumerable, they can't be the 144,000. It just makes sense. Also, this group is in heaven and not on the earth. They come from all walks of life, from nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. They're not just Jewish. The 144,000 are all Jewish. We talked about that last week. And they are not sealed for protection because they're in heaven. They've come out of the tribulation period. They've been martyred for their faith. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. That's what's going on here. The gospel is being spread to all the world. Through the 144, or the two witnesses, 144,000 now Jewish witnesses. And now this innumerable multitude of saints that come to the faith during the tribulation period. And these are the saints who were under the altar in Revelation chapter 6. And now they're standing before the throne of God. Revelation 6, 11, then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. So there is that number that God is waiting for, of the tri these tribulation saints being martyred for their faith, and then God is going to finish the judgment. The Greek word for white speaks of shining brilliance, dazzling white, as pure white, pure and white as fresh snow. Now, we know what snow is like after it's been here a while, right? It's really dirty. It's not real pretty. But have you ever gotten up in the morning after it's snowed out? It is so white. It's just glistening. That's these robes that they have on. And it wasn't that by their good works that they were saved. They were saved by faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, Revelation 3, 5, when Jesus wrote his letter to the church in Sardis, he said, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot, his, blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now the question is, well, how do we become overcomers? 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that it has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? There it is. It's our faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way to heaven except through Christ and his finished work on the cross of Calvary for us. And this group of people come from many cultures, many backgrounds, and they're all saved the same way through Jesus. And it's interesting today, and I, again, I don't get this because the scriptures are really clear, but there are those today who believe that you just have to have faith in something and you're going to be saved. Well, that's not what the Bible says. There are those who believe that the Jews are saved differently than the Gentiles. The Jews are saved by the law. And Gentiles are saved by grace. Well, has any Jew been saved by keeping the law? No. There hasn't been one. What, what did Paul follow? His faith in Jesus Christ. He was a Jew. Right? Jews are saved just as Gentiles are saved by faith in Jesus. In fact, remember, it, it, they had the big council meeting in Jerusalem. James was the head of the church in Jerusalem. And there was the Gentiles are getting saved all over the place. And now these Jews are saying, hey, they have to be circumcised. They've got to keep the law of Moses. We've got to fix this. Gentiles have to do this. And Peter spoke and Paul spoke, but Peter said something very interesting. He basically said, look, none of us Jews have ever been able to keep the law. Our fathers couldn't. We can't. Why are we putting this burden on the Gentiles to keep the law? It makes no sense. 
And he then said in Acts 15, 11, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And the Holy Spirit is incredible because if Peter said the Jew, that the Gentiles are saved just as the Jews, I'm sure there would have been some Jews saying, See, you got to keep the law of Moses, you got to be circumcised. But Peter said, The Jews are saved just like the Gentiles are saved. How? By grace through faith in Jesus. Very simple. In fact, Acts 4.12, Peter clears it up for us. He says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's pretty clear. I don't know how you could be any clearer than that. And yet many believe that salvation is open to anyone, you just, and it doesn't matter how you get there. You could just take any road. Well, that's ridiculous. And to believe that, the devil is so good because people are comfortable then dying because they think they're going to heaven and they're not. There's only one way and that's through Jesus. So these tribulation saints have white robes on. They're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They have palm branches in their hands. And I think the palm branches represent the victory that God has given them through Jesus Christ. One writer put it like this. He said, palm branches were emblems of victory. It shows this great multitude celebrates a great victory. From Spurgeon, he said, The palm, the ensign of the triumph, indicates most certainly a conflict and conquest. As on earth, the palm would not be given if not won. Therefore, we may conclude that the Lord would not have distributed this prize unless there had been a preceding warfare and victory. From the very fact that these glorified ones are holding palm branches, we may infer that they did not come from beds of sloth, or gardens of pleasure, or palaces of peace, but that they endured hardness and battle as men and women trained for war. Wow. They didn't take their salvation for granted. They were willing to die for what they believed. There was a cost in their service to the Lord. Now, it's interesting because when we get to Revelation 24, we see what happens to many of these dear saints. How are they martyred? And this is what it says. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Have you ever thought there would be beheadings? I mean, we, I guess we see it today. What group of people do beheadings? Muslims. Isn't that interesting? I think it was the Marines who were called leathernecks. Do you know why they were called leathernecks? Because they had leather collars on to prevent, prevent them from getting hacked by Muslims. It, the leathernecks, it just makes sense. And here, here we are, 2021, I don't know when the, when the rapture is going to happen and the tribulation is going to start, but you think, how crazy, they're going to be beheaded for their faith. Very interesting. We have to understand that our faith is going to be tested probably like never before. I don't think we've ever seen real persecution in America like we're going to be seeing. I truly believe it. Uh, we're starting to see it with the whole COVID thing and the vax and the unvaxed and, and uh, we in Australia, in parts of Australia, they're pulling people out of their homes if they're not, if they haven't had the vaccination, and by soldiers. So things are getting crazy. And what about our faith in Christ? I think, well, what's wrong with that? Well, do you realize that God calls sin, sin? And as this world becomes and this nation becomes more sinful, the things we are saying as we teach the word of God, are coming against them. So who are they going to come after? They're going to come after us because they really can't come after God. And they'll try and take away the Bible or edit the Bible, those things that they don't like. They're fine with God of love. Oh, he's love, love, love. But God of judgment? No. God of sin? No. They don't want to deal with that. So understand that. Several years back, Far-Reaching Ministries reported the following. This is what transpired in the Sudan. 
12 bombs were dropped by bombers from the Muslim north, all hitting civilian areas. Because a generator was running, they did not hear the bombers coming, and so many of them had never had a chance to make it to the foxhole. For Marcello and two other chaplains, they only had to go 10 feet from their barracks to the foxhole, and as it turned out, even that was too far to go. As the bomb was falling, the other two chaplains who were with Marcello hit the ground, but Marcello kept running, and as this bomb exploded only 20 feet from where he was at, it killed him in minutes as the bomb tore through him. Wes Bentley, head of far-reaching ministries in war-torn Sudan, said, When the last bomb was dropped and we got up to help those who were hurt and survey the damage, we found several of the chaplains weeping deeply over the loss of Marcello. Joseph, a senior chaplain who was especially close to Marcello, was very broken over his death. Rick Deem, who is part of our U.S. staff and serves as an operations and training officer for the Chaplain's Corps, walked up to Joseph and said, Joseph, sometimes the cost of following Jesus Christ is very costly. Are you still called to this ministry? And Joseph turned to him with tears running out of his eyes and said, Brother, I am still called to this work. I'm still called to my people. Marcello was 28 years old, married, and had three children. You know, what a heartbreaking story, but I can't help but thinking what Paul wrote in Philippians 121, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. We live this life for Christ and in death we gain it all. We go back to be with our Lord and Savior, just as Marcello did. He lived for Christ, now he's with the one he loved so dearly, he gave his life for him. And in his death, the work didn't stop, the work of God. In fact, it intensified more. They realized they may only have one more day to share Christ before they're called home, and it gave them the determination and desire to reach people for Christ in this war-torn country. How about us? I mean, we're not living in a war-torn country, but are we willing to sacrifice and minister the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, it was kind of sad to me, you know, we got this Wendingo thing, this occult thing going on. And it's not outside anymore. Now it's at the Expo Center. So it's indoors. So we can't really witness. I guess we have to pay to get inside and all that. And I'm not going to pay to go inside. But are we willing to sacrifice? You know, I realize with COVID, people freak out and all that. But is God in control? And is there a lost world out there that needs to hear about Jesus? Are we going to hide in caves and not do anything? Uh, for the life of me, I can't. You know, I have a chance to go into Russia. People go, oh, you're going to Russia, isn't it? You're flying on a plane, COVID's all over the place. You know, God has given me the gift to teach. They want me to go there and teach at the pastor's conference. They want me to go there and teach at a couple of their churches. Am I going to pass that up because I'm afraid? No. What if I die? Well, then it was my time, Right? I mean, I don't worry about that stuff because I know where I'm going. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. And yes, I want to be here. I want to be able to train people up. But if it's time for me to go home, it's time for me to go home. Paul said in Philippians 1.20, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. There's a man who had faith. He was just doing what the Lord called him to do and nothing was going to stop him. That needs to be the passion of our hearts and lives. You know, back in Revelation 6, Verses 15 through 17, we're told, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. That's what they said. Look at the contrast here in Revelation 7, 9, and 10 of these tribulation saints. John said, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, people, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Ah, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne 
and to the Lamb. Wow. Completely different picture, right? One group is facing judgment. The other group is facing eternal life with the Lord. They're before God the Father and the Lamb, Jesus Christ. They're able to stand before the Lord, not in their own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed into their lives by faith. Look at verse 11 here in Revelation 7. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. What's heaven filled with? Worship. It's filled with worship. We see it over and over in the book of Revelation. And think about it. If you truly believe what you're singing about, you're going to sing loud and strong. You'll sing with feeling and emotion. And I realize for me, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. But it doesn't really matter because by the time it gets to the Lord's ears, he fine tunes it. I sing with joy, I sing loud, I sing strong because I love the Lord and I love praising him. And that's what heaven's about, worship of God. But why don't we see that worship today? And I'm not just talking about singing because I think sometimes we're so busy, so preoccupied that we miss the majesty of God and the blessings he's bestowed upon us. Think about what God has done for each of us. And most importantly, he saved us from our sins even when we're still in rebellion against him. He died for us. It's easy to get our eyes off of God and focus on not necessarily bad things. You know, Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet both to Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel was to the north, the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah in the south, the southern kingdom of Israel, and his ministry spanned some four kings in Judah, lasted some 40 years. And his ministry began at the end of King Uzziah's reign. And make no mistake about it, King Uzziah was a godly king, a good king. He ruled the people in the southern kingdom of Judah. But what is interesting to me in Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 4, is what Isaiah tells us. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, here's the question. Why did Isaiah see the Lord in the year King Uzziah died? Kind of interesting. I think one of the reasons was his focus was on King Uzziah instead of focusing on the Lord. And that can be a dangerous thing to do even if the person is a godly man or woman. You know, the best of men are men at best. And his relationship with the Lord, I think, was kind of through Uzziah. At least that's what it seems. You know, and I understand Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. So you think, well, what's wrong with what Isaiah is doing? Well, let me say this. When I first got saved, I followed my pastor, Pastor Phil. I watched what he did. I learned from him. I was growing. But Pastor Phil never, never, never told me to focus on him. But I watched him because he always pointed me back to the Lord. But then came a point when I looked to the Lord. I matured in the faith. And yeah, we can learn from each other, but we need to see the Lord. And what happens as we see the Lord? Well, Isaiah 6, verse 5. So I said, woe is me. This is Isaiah. For I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, when we see the Lord, how do we see ourselves? Oh, as we really are, as sinners. And that's what Isaiah saw. But the Lord doesn't leave us there. In verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah 6, 
We're told, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which had been taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Here it is. Once you've seen the Lord, once the Lord has touched you, you know what happens next? Ministry. Ministry. Again, Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. God is looking for someone to represent him. And all we have to do is step forward and walk by faith. And you think, well, what does that have to do with worship? Everything. Because our lives are a living sacrifice unto him. And as we see the Lord, as the Lord touches us, as we walk by faith, it's our spiritual worship unto him. You know, if, we, if, our, if worship is the occupation of heaven, then it should be what we do here on earth. We should always see the majesty of God. Because all we do should be a living sacrifice unto him. And here we see angelic beings here in Revelation 7 worship the Lord. Myriads of angels, elders who represent the church worship the Lord. There's an innumerable number of saints, four living creatures, and they fall on their faces in honor of him. Again, worship is the occupation of those in heaven, not just with words or song, but with action. Now, why are they worshiping the Lord here? I think it's because of this great multitude that no one can number from all nations, tribes, people, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands, crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Look at all these dear saints saved from where? The tribulation period. Innumerable. Wow. Do you realize that in heaven, when Someone here on earth gets saved, all heaven rejoices, the angels are rejoicing. I, I'm excited about being with the Lord because I want to hear the angels rejoice when someone gets saved. Can you imagine what heaven's like? All the time, man. Here's some saved here, someone saved in this part of the world, this part of the world, and they're praising God. Look at the grace and mercy of God reaching out to sinful man even during the tribulation period. Now, as we read on, look at these dear saints that come to the Lord during the tribulation period. Look at verse 13 here in Revelation 7. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, it's kind of interesting. Why did... The elder asked John who these people are if he already knew. Well, John needed to know this information. In fact, one writer said the dialogue format used from time to time convey an explanation of a vision. So he wants John to understand this information. And John's not sure. So this can't be the church because he would know who these people are. And after... And again, if this is the church here in Revelation 7, why would John or the elder have to distinguish this group from the rest of the church? He wouldn't. It wouldn't make sense. And again, these are the ones who, what come out in verse 14 of what? The great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. It wasn't their good works. It wasn't because they went to some church. It wasn't because they belonged to some religious group. They were made white because they were washed in the blood of the Lamb. In fact, in the Greek, it would be translated, these are those who come out of the tribulation, the great one. Wow. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 21, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. In fact, in the ancient Greek grammar of this passage, the word the is emphatic or definite, and this multitude comes out of the great tribulation or that's where the majority of them come from that last three and a half year period of time of the great tribulation period 
Am I saying that none of them are martyred for their faith in the faith in the first three and a half? No. I think some are. But remember when the Antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies and demands to be worshipped as God? These Christians aren't going to do that. The Jews aren't going to do that. He's going to come after them with total anger. And he's going to have them martyred for their faith. So yeah, the last three and a half years are going to be really, really tough. Many will come out of that period of time. Uh, John Wolverd said this. He said, some believe that the majority of saints in the tribulation will die as martyrs, but many will be killed by earthquakes, war, pestilence. Others will be the object of special persecution by the world ruler, the Antichrist. They will be hounded to death, much as the Jews were in World War II. Because they will not worship the beast, they will be under a death sentence. Those who accept Christ in that time may be faced with the solemn alternative of either renouncing their faith in Christ and worshiping the beast or being slain. The result will be multiplied thousands of martyrs. Absolutely. And look at the description. Look at how they're saved. They're washed in the blood of Christ. Their robes are made white. Not by their own efforts, by the blood of the Lamb. You know, Paul in Hebrews 9.14 said, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Wow. And I realize people go, wow, well, come on, you really think that his shed blood cleansed me of my sins? Absolutely. Because that's what the Bible says. I trust what God says. I don't trust what man tells me. Man can believe whatever he wants. Isaiah said in Isaiah 118, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow that they are red like Clemson, they shall be as wool. You know, if we have sin in our lives, how can we be as white as snow? We can't by our own efforts, but only by the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all our sins. Now, again, how can people think there are other ways to God because they don't want Jesus. Isn't there interesting? There's something about the name of Jesus. You can talk about anything. You know, I, for example, I mean, talking with Catholics, I can talk about the Pope, I could talk about Mary, I could talk about dead saints, I could talk about Mother Teresa. But when I bring up Jesus, well, you know, that, that's a personal thing. What do you mean it's a personal thing? No, it's for everyone. If, why would I not want to talk about Jesus? He's the one who saved me. The Pope didn't. Mary didn't. The dead saints didn't. The church didn't. Jesus did. But there's something about that name. When people swear, do they swear by the name of Buddha? Confucius? Allah? No, but by Jesus. There's something about that name. You see... He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. So what does Satan do? Try and push people away from the only one who could save them, and that's Jesus. Now, again, there are many people today who are changing the idea about the rapture of the church. Some don't even believe in it. Um, there's a a big thing that happened several years ago with the pre-wrath rapture. Marv Rosenthal brought that out. Um, and they kind of believe that uh, we go through a good portion of the tribulation period. Somewhere after the midpoint, when the seventh trumpet blows, then the rapture happens. I don't see it that way. Uh, we've dealt with this pretty heavily, but there's a big difference between the church and these tribulation saints, and I want to point that out here. In Revelation 1.6, we're talking about the church, the bride of Christ. And he has made us kings and priests, his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 2 Timothy 2.12, Paul says, If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Revelation 26, 
Blessed and holy is he who has his part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You go, well, what's my point? We are going to rule and reign with Christ, but these tribulation saints have a different role. They will be before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the millennial kingdom. That is what John is going to tell us as we read on here. And I want you to understand the difference between the church and the tribulation saints. Look at verse 15 here in Revelation chapter 7. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So these dear saints who suffered so much for their faith on earth are now before God and they're serving him. They're not going to hunger. Why? Because the bread of life, Jesus Christ, is going to meet their needs. They're not going to thirst anymore because the fountain of living water, Jesus Christ, will satisfy their thirst. They're not going to face any physical affliction because they are, they're with the strong tower, Jesus Christ. He's watching over them, protecting them. No one's going to hurt them in heaven. You see, those days are over, and now they're in the presence of the Lord. That was one of David's desires, Psalm 27, 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that it may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to acquire in his temple. I guess it doesn't get any better than that, right? My pastor wrote this of these tribulation saints. This becomes all the more significant when you remember that these people came out of the great tribulation. They didn't take the mark of the beast, which means they couldn't buy or sell. That meant that many of them probably starved to death. As they suffered the horrors of the great tribulation, these redeemed people of God had endured hunger, thirst, and scorching heat. A phenomenon which will occur in the Great Tribulation as the sun possibly goes into a Nova-like condition. But for all the physical torment and mental pain of fearing for their lives and the lives of their loved ones, it's all over. They will never shed another tear for all eternity. They will never again feel hunger or thirst. They will never experience pain or heartache or depression or sorrow or death ever again. Wow. And that's what awaits us. God is going to dwell among them. It's interesting. And it, that word for dwell in Revelation 7.15 is the Greek word skeno. And we read this word in John 1.14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God dwelt among them. He became flesh. They saw him face to face. That's what John's saying. Now, it's interesting because the Jews connected the word um, skeno, the Greek word, to Shekinah, which spoke of the glory of God or the presence of God. Now, they're not the same word, and yet that's how the Jews used it. You know, when Solomon finished the temple, what fire came down, consumed the burnt offering, the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Wow, the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory spoke of his presence. When the Lord filled the tabernacle, it was seen by a fire by night and a cloud by day as they traveled in the wilderness. And think about when God dwelt among them, they saw his glory. It was covered in flesh, but he was there with them. And again, it's out of all that that they're not going to hunger or thirst anymore. The sun's not going to strike them, nor the heat. But the lamb who's in their midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to fountains of living waters, wiping away every tear. Now, here's the thing. There's no sorrow or sadness or tears in heaven, except what we saw when John saw no one opening the scroll, take the scroll out of the Father's right hand and, and open it. They couldn't even look upon it. And John was weeping in heaven. That's the only instance I know of weeping in heaven. But not for us. Every tear is going to be wiped away. All the pain and suffering we, we endured in this life, it's not going to affect us in heaven. 
And for these tribulation saints, wow, think about all they endured for their faith. All taken away. They're in the presence of God. And what about family and friends who've rejected Jesus? Won't we be sorrowful over that? We won't remember them, I don't think. Because again, heaven would be a place where everyone would be very sorrowful because there's a lot of family and friends that we know who have rejected Jesus. So I don't think we'll remember them. We'll know each other, but we won't remember loved ones who haven't made it. All those tears will be taken away, and I like that. I don't know how God's going to accomplish it all. I don't have to. I have enough trouble just living my daily life than to wonder how he's going to do all this. Here's what I do know. It says he's going to take away every tear. And I believe it by faith. And I'll let God handle it. Because that's going to be a wonderful thing. Can you imagine what heaven is going to be like? You know, can you imagine what the worship in heaven is going to sound like? I'll have a good voice by then. Praise God for that. But wow, the myriads of people, angels, the church, these tribulation states, all worshiping God. Wow, incredible. In fact, we even see this spoken of in Isaiah 25, verses 8 and 9, that God's going to take away our t- the tears, wipe them away. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. In Revelation 21.4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. That's the eternal state after the millennial reign of Christ or the thousand-year reign of Christ. No more death. Is there death in the millennial kingdom? Yeah, but it's very few and far in between. You know, if a child dies at 100, it's a rarity. A child is 100 years old. Can you imagine that? You know, I'm, I'm 63. I'm not a child. Well, my wife says I'm still a child, but that's a different story. Can you imagine? No more death. No more pain. I can't wait to get up in the morning and jump out of bed and not have any pain. I, you shouldn't have pain when you sleep at night and get up in the morning, right? You did nothing but sleep. But I do, and I'm sure many of you do too. And what about the beauty of heaven? Can you imagine? Wow. And that's what's in store for us. We've seen over the last two weeks now two groups of people in Revelation 7. The 144,000 Jewish witnesses who are sealed by God for protection and they share the love of Christ during the tribulation period. They're here on earth. And we'll see that they're sealed now here in 7 and then these winds of judgment are going to blow forth as The seals are open in Revelation chapter 8. And I I truly believe it's out of their witness of Christ we have this innumerable group of tribulation saints who now have been martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ during the tribulation period. The majority in the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period. Now, one writer put it this way. He said, In this age when Christianity is under siege on all sides, Seemingly losing its grip on divine truth and apparently headed for defeat, it is comforting to be reassured of the ultimate triumph of God's saving grace. In the midst of an even worse situation in the future before Christ's return, God will redeem his people. That thought should bring present-day believers great comfort and motivate all to praise God for the greatness of his redemptive plan. And ultimately, in the eternal state, all these promises will come true for all believers. Here's the thing. Don't lose hope. I mean, I see what's going on in this nation, the world. I think we only have a small glimpse of all the evil that's going on. God sees everything, and it troubles us. But don't lose hope. God's still in control. He's never lost control. He told us what's going to happen before it happens. In fact, I think it's Isaiah 44 talks about that. I have shown you these things before they've happened. 
Do not fear, he says. You be a witness of me now. What is that about? Well, when everything is falling apart or looks like it's falling apart, don't fear. You be a witness because he's in control. I think those are just powerful, powerful words. He'll take care of us. And if you're struggling at all, read the scriptures. I, I like what Psalm 121 says. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He, will, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Who's watching us, guys? The Lord is. You know, and it wasn't that the psalmist was looking to some hills or mountains for his help. He knew that within the hills of Jerusalem and the temple of God is where his help was. That was his destination. That's where he was making his pilgrimage to worship God. Jeremiah 3.23, truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Absolutely. Was it a dangerous journey to travel there? Sure it was. But God is watching over this pilgrim as he makes his journey. You know, have you ever played hockey or football and just been run over by someone? And maybe it happened several times and in maybe one game. Where was your team? Weren't they there to protect you? What happened? Well, they didn't miss it, right? In this game of life, you might say, we can try and do things in the power of our might. We can try to do things with the help of others. But in the end, we're going to get run over. Who's our strength? Who's our strong tower that we run to? It's the Lord. He will see us through the situations we face. But how often will you let the problems of life overwhelm us? You know, the sun is huge. It's 865,000 miles in diameter. And you know how big of a guy I am. I could block out the sun just with my fist. What are you laughing at? I can. I can do it. Believe me. I can block out the sun because I'm such a big guy. You know how? How? When I put my fist right in front of my face and I could block out the sun completely. I can place my problems right in front of my face. And that's all I see is all the problems I'm having. And I block out the son of God. And I need to take my hands away. I need to look to the son of God for my strength, for my help. He is my deliverer. He's my protector. And I'm so thankful for that. As we continue on next time, we're going to see the seventh seal being opened. And within that seventh seal are the seven trumpet judgments. And they're going to be unleashed. And like I said, we're going to deal with the first four trumpet judgments. That's what Revelation chapter 8 covers. And the angel in heaven is crying out with a loud voice saying, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So the fifth, sixth, seventh trumpet judgments, you think the first four were bad? You ain't seen nothing yet. This is again after the three and a half year mark. This is in the last three and a half years, close towards the end of the seven-year tribulation period. And by the time we get to the bold judgments, they have to be at the very end because the destruction is so severe that man would not be able to survive very long. But for us, because we've come to Christ, we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we're going to spend eternity with him. <sighs> what a day. And we want as many people to come into the kingdom of God before the Lord calls his bride home, the church. May we be witnesses of him in this day. 
not fearful, but encouraged because all that God has said, we are seeing come to pass before our eyes. We should be the most excited people in the world knowing our bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is coming back for us soon. Let's be ready. Let's be witnessing. Let's not fear. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word and how encouraging it is. We see these tribulation saints and their faith. They were willing to die for you, Lord, because they believe in you and they love you so much that they weren't going to compromise their faith. They were not going to renounce their faith. They were willing to die. Lord, may we be willing to live for you and shine for you in these days. Thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.